Ladies and gentlemen, the program will resume momentarily. Please take your seats. Okay, the, uh, I think we lost a few folks on that break. The, uh, maybe, maybe a few will come back in, but the, uh, uh, they're going to they're gonna miss the best part here, I think, because uh, I think this is going to be a, a, a great discussion uh, we're about to have. Uh, our final panel today is a discussion of the national security impl 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 <laughs> implications of 5G implementation. Uh, we're going to start, even though our panel is on stage, uh, we're going to start with a perspective on the CI and security threats affecting 5G uh, by Bill Evanina, director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. Bill is going to tell us here shortly how your doorbell, your refrigerator, your Echo Dot, your car, and your smartphone are going to ruin your life as you know it. Okay. So, a long-standing friend of ENSA, Bill and his team at NCSC do a tremendous job, day in and day out, to protect our nation's security. Bill, thank you for your service, your leadership, uh, for joining us this afternoon to kick off this important discussion. After Bill sets the scene, we will hear from our panel of industry and government leaders. So please hold your questions for Bill uh, until the end of the panel discussion, uh, and then he's going to still be here and will be available to take questions in along with the, the panel members, if that's okay with you, Bill. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Bill Evanina. Good afternoon. So how awesome is this panel? After today's entire agenda and kudos to INZA and the partners for putting together an amazing yet a phenomenal agenda for the entire day. We get to culminate today's sessions with an amazing uh, talented group of individuals to walk you through the complexity of fire means from a national security perspective. If we thought cyber and supply chain were complicated, this is three times that, 5G. And 5G is 5G and depending on where you sit, it means something totally different to you, your company, your business, your government organization. But I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the 5G implications from where I sit. Leading our counterintelligence and security apparatus for the nation, what this means to us, not only next year, but in 10 years. You heard about the threats in this last panel, how they manifest in the difficulty of driving a common lexicon, a narrative, threat, intelligence matrix, add that to the complexity of 5G. And we go through 5G, I look at 5G not as a telecommunications backbone for the future of the world, because it is that. I look at it from a perspective of the horrible ideals that can penetrate this prospect through security and counterintelligence. We could spend all day talking about privacy and civil liberties, because that's going to be a part of this, but I want to specifically talk about nation state threats and the prospects that we face from a national security perspective. I'm going to start specifically with China. So as we all know, Xi Jinping has now become the quasi-emperor of China. He has one goal, to be the global leader geopolitically, militarily, and economically. Owning and controlling the 5G global network will provide that for him in a basket a silver platter, or whatever your metaphor is. It is the golden goose for him. As you've seen, strategically the last decade, they have been promulgating their global telecommunication network around the globe. Not without strategy. Not without strategy. So you hear all the time, well, why? Why are we all so interested in, in Huawei? What's the big issue with Huawei? Huawei, Huawei, Huawei. 
Well, let's not forget DOJ just indicted Huawei for some significant criminal allegations that if you read the indictment will make your stomach upset about how that impacted and how they stole data. They provided it to countries that shouldn't get it, but it shows the viciousness and the intent of China utilizing their companies to do their bidding. So you're saying, well, what is the global threat here? Let's start with our threat here in the US. Let's look at what happens 10 years from now to our country if China continues to drive not only the specifications, the tools, the techniques, the hardware, the infrastructure to build this 5G network. You have a slew of experts here going to talk about what that looks like, feels like. And when you talk about things are going to move 100 times faster than they do now, we can't defend what we do now. From a cyber perspective, in the private sector, we have best practices that aren't that best yet. The government is a long way away. So we haven't found that solution today. And I'm worried about how are we going to solve this when we're at 100 times faster than this capability. And we have the Internet of Things impacting everything we do all day long. How difficult it is for our ability to understand what core positions are in the world. What is the CISO's job going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now? How will a CIO be able to manifest its job delivering services for their CEO in a 5G network? It's going to be problematic. So you say, well, why is Huawei a big deal? Why should we worry about Huawei? I want to walk through a little bit of reasons why I look at it as a Huawei. I don't think it's a Huawei issue. This is not about Huawei. It's about the People's Republic of China, a communist country that provides all of its citizens with a social score, surveils every bit of your life, has no norms, no values, has no constitution, no bill of rights, and lives and breathes and successes on an unfair playing field. Let me walk you through 10 years from now, if Huawei or any other company in the People's Republic of China is successful enough to own the global network apparatus, which we're looking to call 5G. Let's use that as a precursor to what I'm about to read to you. Think of that as an ideal. And remember that unlike this country, which I believe is the best country ever invented, there's a clear bifurcation here in the US between the government, the private sector, and the criminal element, for the most part, depending on what state you're from. So that's not the case in China. Everyone works for Mother China, they work for Xi Jinping and the, and the Communist Party. And be, because of that, you work for the Ministry of State Security. Now, 10 years from now, China controls the 5G network. So let me just read a couple of things that I think are important. 2017, China's national intelligence law. Article 7 reads this. Any organization, business, or citizen shall, shall support, assist, cooperate with state intelligence work in accordance with the law and maintain the secrecy of all knowledge of state intelligence work. Open source press. Shall, citizen, business, organization. Work with the intelligence services so I don't care you want to call it Huawei, Acme, ShopRite, doesn't make a difference. They're beholden to the People's Republic of China. Do we want that in our systems, running across our nations, our health systems, our autonomous vehicles, our other things? You hear talk, talk, you want this to be part of your refrigerator and your Alexa and your ability to have your health insurance move at light speed 100 times faster. Next. We'll go to the Article 28 of China's cybersecurity law. Network operators shall provide technical support and assistance to public security organizations and national security organizations. So think about that 10 years from now, five years from now, when your company is entering a data sharing agreement with a company from China. Will your general counsel be aware of these clauses and understand what this means when you sign these agreements? One last quote I'll read here from Article 11 of China's National Security Law. All citizens, in caps, all citizens of the People's Republic of China shall have the responsibility and obligation to maintain our national security. So think about the complexities we have right now with supply chain, critical infrastructure, and our ability and inability to protect our energy sector, 
our financial sector, our telecommunications sector. This will impact all of that. How we drive, build, and moderate, and I would even say govern 5G has, for me, significant national security implications that if we don't deal with this now, 10 years from now, it's going to be too late. Three years from now, it's going to be too late. This isn't going to happen like on July 1st. This is going to be a, an iterative process to build this 5G network. But we have to understand the parameters if we allow a country like China to control every aspect of the global telecommunication network. It's my job is to provide the threat and warning to what this looks like from our perspective. I believe it's the epitome of what we're going to accomplish this is with the perfect, perfect public-private partnership that has to exist to be able to have our ecosystem and driving our telecommunications processes of which everything will cross through to be able to be safe and protected from us. We worry about PII now and data theft now. Think about what that looks like five years from now when we're at 50 times speed with an inability to, to identify malware. So those indicators are compromised. How are we even going to see them when they're at that speed? And yet we are going to be beholden to a communist country's beliefs, ideologies, and norms, or lack thereof, to be able to combat that issue. So from my perspective, 5G is it. It is very close to as an important thing that I have seen in my career, looking forward in the future, that we could prevent and understand now. My last concern I'll say on this, and you heard this in the last panel, discussion with cyber, we don't have a common lexicon. We don't have a common narrative. We don't have a common understanding of what 5G is going to be, what it is, what the contract is. We have to get there sooner or later so people understand what it is and what it isn't and how it's going to be manifested in our country. I believe this is a, an existential threat to us as a nation if we don't control. Think about this. When is the last time in America we have been beholden to another foreign country for anything? We are on the cusp of that. I don't want to sound dramatic. But it's real. We have to find a solution. And I'm going to look to this panel to start the discussion with what that solution looks like. But it must be a public-private partnership that is for real to be able to understand and protect our nation in years to come. With that, panel, it's all yours. Thank first. Sorry. You're welcome, Chuck. <laughs> and thanks for moving the podium. Mm -hmm. Follow directions <laughs> well. So, uh, so thanks, Bill. Everybody join me in thanking Bill. So one of the things that you may be wondering, there's a piece of paper at, your, at all your tables that's uh, uh, got something about 5G on it. But these are kind of the, the summary conclusions and recommendations of a paper ENSA has been working on on 5G. Uh, we're still kind of polishing the text a little bit. Uh, but uh, this is uh, hopefully going to inform part of the discussion of our panel up here today. And uh, watch your, your email inbox for, uh, for the final report sometime in the, in the coming weeks. And with that, uh, we're going to uh, turn it over to the uh, panel for discussion. Uh, Patrick Tucker uh, is going to moderate this discussion. Those of you that don't know Patrick, shame on you. But, the, uh, oh. but the, uh, Patrick is the technology editor uh, of Defense One. He's written extensively about emerging technology and the national security challenges of 5G. He's the author of The Naked Future, What Happens in a World That Anticipates Your Every Move. Remember that refrigerator? Yeah. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming our moderator, Patrick Tucker. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, uh, Director Ivanina, for, for helping me to this up. Um, so let me just introduce the actual talent. Uh, thank you. But uh, uh, sitting to my left, John Costello is the senior advisor to the director of the Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans for the newly established Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the Department of Homeland Security, where he helps direct CISA's effort, S C I S A, uh, efforts to manage risks to U.S. critical infrastructure stemming from cyber and physical threats. 
Uh, next to him, Dr. James Lewis is a senior vice president at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where he directs the technology program there. Uh, in his role, Dr. Lewis researches, writes, and advises on a range of issues at the intersection of national security and technology. Uh, if you have a chance to <laughs> mob him later for a conversation, he's a wonderful conversationalist full of interesting anecdotes, many of them true. Uh, next to him is <laughs> John uh, Nagengast, is uh, executive director of strategic initiatives for AT&T uh, Global Business, Public Sector Solutions. Uh, in this capacity, he focuses on applying the industry leading capabilities of AT&T to the most challenging national security problems facing the United States. Uh, before that, he served as at the NSA for 38 years, where his last position was Principal Director for Corporate Strategy. Uh, and our final panelist is Leland Brown, Technology Development Manager at Intel Federal, uh, where he focuses on investments in advanced wireless technologies for military and government applications and, and research opportunities. And again, uh, as we start talking here, we're going to have a little bit of chit chat. And I'm going to uh, break away a little bit early to involve all of you uh, in the conversation. And please have questions as well for Director Ivanina, who's going to stay on and be able to answer your questions uh, as well. So uh, keep, put them in your mind and begin to, to think about them uh, as we as we near court kind of like the the midway point but I, I want to start with a question for uh, for both Johns because I think it's important to like start with a foundation and I wonder if you can give me a sense of how uh, hardware and software differ between what the US and Western companies are offering and uh, these big threatening Chinese uh, telecommunications companies what's like the key difference to understand in terms of the nuts and bolts and in terms of the software uh, that's uh, I suppose that goes to me yeah both Johns um, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that's honestly a good question, uh, not having really you know, gotten into the nuts and bolts and done like a technical analysis of the hardware software myself. Um, you know, I think one thing that uh, we're focused on is uh, a number of risk factors we see around uh, vendors and services and, and some of the devices. You know, every device uh, and service that's put out by a vendor is, is baked and sort of, the, you know, uh, is, is molded by the environment in which it is developed and deployed. Uh, I know the, the approach that we're looking at um, from in our ICT Scrim task force uh, at CISA and you know, supply chain efforts writ large is look at what are the risk factors that we know can go into a device or a vendor. I mean, and, and there are a few. There are a few that we know. One, if uh, a vendor has, you know, subject to the uh, undue control and influence of a, of a foreign power, specifically one where we, where we don't have great relations with. Another is, is a vendor that's benefited overwhelmingly from, uh, from policies or lack of recipro reciprocity that's sort of uh, sped their advancement and deployment worldwide. Third, a vendor with a history of corporate malfeasance, fraud, or, uh, or unfair market practices. And, and, and fourth is a vendor that, that has a track record of, of having a, a lack of priority in pushing out secure equipment, mm -hmm. or has used their, uh, or uh, you know, either poor patch updates, poor security engineering design in their hardware and software. So I mean, I, I think we could, you know, we could discuss a comparison between stuff we see from one vendor or one country and another. But I think it's it's a much more helpful uh, conversation to identify uh, the the key risk criteria by which we even had those conversations. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, the you know comparative understanding of what security is between those between devices and between vendors is one of those but yeah. it is by no means the the the, the end all be all of the conversation okay okay uh, first I'd like to say that that's please read the report when it comes out because we do delve into that very topic mm -hmm. and what I want to say here to, to start the conversation is you know from an industry perspective the large wireless carriers I think we're all going down the same path pretty much and we want to be move away from vendor lock-in to what we're now calling vendor disaggregation and the way we're doing that is through virtualization of the infrastructure <clears throat> we want to move away from dedicated hardware and we want to be able to rely on open source uh, software as opposed to vendor proprietary. Mm -hmm. When we built the 3G infrastructure in the United States, it was choose your vendor, mm -hmm. and it happened to be at the time. Uh, it was uh, Alcatel and uh, Nortel, 
to, we, we, we used to use this trusted vendor philosophy and form these partnerships with these vendors, mm -hmm. and they would, we would split half of our cities between you know, vendor X and vendor Y. In this case, it was Nortel and Alcatel, where after we did trials and tested the various suppliers, we chose those guys. But in, back in those days, even though they were supposedly based on international standards, 3GPP was the uh, standards body per se, uh, they were all vendor proprietary, so you were locked in. Once you bought the, you know, from Nokia, you were stuck with Nokia for basically for the rest of that generation of technology mm -hmm. because nobody else's stuff would, could, could fit into their model. They always made sure that when you bought Nokia, you bought the whole, you bought the whole ball of wax from them, right. all their hardware all their software. What we're trying to do now is move away from that. We are pushing hard in the international uh, arena on standards mm -hmm. and on the uh, open source software using the Linux Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to drive it to the point where you can plug in anywhere in your infrastructure, whoever you think has the best piece of software to fit that fit that model. Obviously, you're still going to have hardware, mm -hmm. and we are moving towards a white box model as opposed to we, we must buy vendor X or vendor Y because mm -hmm. that's the only hardware that will work with the guy's software. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to plug in a, a, a generic processor that will be whatever we the software tells it to be. Today, you can be a router. Tomorrow, you can be a switch. The next day, you can be a RAN interface. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can continually update the software to improve the performance. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there because we can get into some, some more of that later on. Yeah. But we think that's a big advantage from a security perspective. And it avoids this vendor locked in, lock in yeah. so that when, when if a better piece of software comes along to perform a particular function yeah. and it's compliant with these standards, we can plug it in yeah. and, we, keep, and improve, continually improve the operation of the network mm -hmm. without being tied to any particular vendor. We want to avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should turn to Leland. Leland also was a chip maker, Intel, uh, also has a perspective on this, the actual differences between these devices. Well, yeah, I just want to, uh, well, excuse me, I wanted to add to uh, John's point. I have like 12 years experience on working for wireless carriers. Mm -hmm. So I remember when 3.3G had rooms of, of, of hardware. So, so you, you know, you're seeing the industry really move from a hardware center to a software center plat platform. One of the things that you're looking at is a lot of software defined radios, um, mm -hmm. software defined frequency selection, software defined protocol. and. Um, that's where Intel really plays. You know, we're, we're not just uh, looking at the RF modem client in terms mm -hmm. of what goes into your cell phone or your end device usage. We have an end-to-end -end strategy where we're looking at how can we contribute to the 5G network build from the RAN software-defined mm -hmm. network in a box type of type of application, mm -hmm. all the way up to the mobile edge compute, which is a key component of all this in terms of latency and um, and high throughputs. So you know. In terms of that hardware to software in interface, you're seeing less hardware and more software cap cap capabilities infused here. Yeah. Um, even on the side of uh, military applications, um, just to make this point, I've, I worked for for uh, U.S. Army CECOM in my early days, so a lot of the asks technically came to that point. How can we? provide software fine capabilities. So that yeah. leveraging over to that military and uh, government space, you're seeing the same ask and request. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good point. In the last couple of years, I've seen software defined everything just invade the discussion about how to do things in a way that lets you actually sort of keep up with the way uh, life and digital world actually moves. You have uh, software defined virtually everything, virtual machines on top of virtual machines and, and everything else. Does that in expand the scale of risk John, um, and, and how, how best to understand the scale of this risk of uh, Chinese telecom, 5G software and hardware in terms of the future? How, give me a sense of a map of how big this is, a potential problem. So, you know, I think uh, we, we talk about 5G, I mean, at least from, from our perspective, uh, you know, DHS, uh, writ large, we see three categories of, of risks from a national security perspective. Just talk about those real quickly. Um, one is, um, 
One is risk of disruption. You know, uh, with with the sort of this constant contact, pervasive connectivity, high throughput, um, you're going to have products and functions that are designed with the availability of that communication in mind. Right. If it's disrupted intentionally or unintentionally, um, it, it could have consequences, especially if we look at where we expect uh, um, 5G devices to be enabled and applied. You know, industrial, Internet of Things, regular Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, mass transit. Mm -hmm. You have disruptions in, in those. Um, you know, you, it's a public safety issue. You're right. gonna, I mean, you, you know, physical destruction, human life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a fire and brimstone talk because um, we're, we're recognize that, we run that risk with a lot of communications <laughs> issues. So, I mean, number one, we're looking at, we, you know, we have to look at the risk, that risk of disruption and putting reliability behind it. Mm -hmm. Second is, is a risk of, obviously risk of espionage or compromise, which a lot of people have talked about, so I'm not gonna, not gonna touch on that too mm -hmm. much. Um, third is, um, the ecosystem risk, the risks that we come from the ecosystem. This is, this is going to enable millions or billions of devices. There's going to be a proliferation of things connected to the internet. Mm -hmm. um, look back at October 2017 with the Mirai botnet. Um, that's, that was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, hackers were able to enslave a few hundred thousand devices across the world and launch the largest DDoS attack in, in history. And that was because there was you know, vulnerabilities in a number of devices that they were able to compromise. And, um, and enterprises, in some cases, didn't protect their Internet of Things devices and thus were open to that compromise. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2017. That mm -hmm. was before 5G. So when you look at 5G going forward, you see the sheer number of devices yeah. that are going to be there. There's, there's the, the both the enterprise risk on protecting your IoT devices and the manufacturer uh, risk of you know, vulnerability and compromise. That, I mean, we have to make sure that that ecosystem is ready and prepared. Otherwise, um, you know, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be dealing with a, you know, a lot of uh, ammo for someone's yeah. cannon for a DDoS attack. So, does DHS have a tier of like uh, severity of potential problems, or like DDoS is most likely highest impact, easiest to mitigate, and uh, uh, intelligence loss uh, being uh, least <laughs> likely, most difficult to mitigate, et cetera? Is that our tier? Um, like an orange, yellow, yeah. blue. Um, <laughs> um, what I'll say on like how we view the risks is I mean, right now uh, our National Risk Management Center is working on a, a risk assessment. On, working on, on a risk assessment? Yeah, is working on a risk assessment in 5G. Um, but I wanted to give sort of a broad overview on the national security risks mm -hmm. that we see uh, from 5G, which, I mean, to be absolutely clear, those are risks. We're, I mean, I think we're aware of them. And it's just, it's... Um, it's, you know, the responsibility is on us working with industry to, to address those. I okay. Mean, yeah. When does the risk assessment come out? Um, soon. Will it be shared with everybody? Uh, I, um, I'm not entirely sure. I, okay. I can get back to you on that, though. Please do, but and, not everyone uh, else, just me. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, like, on this, uh, one of the big issues that's related to 5G right now is this uh, enormous political and, and uh, transatlantic discussion around what to do about this. Like there's a lobbying effort of what you're trying to bring in uh, international partners to help understand the severity of this and then take action like banning certain tel Chinese telecom providers from doing business there. Uh, and uh, having observed this and observed some of the, the transatlantic discussion, uh, it, it occurs to me that it sort of resembles the conversation that my parents would have about me when I would come home late uh, smelling of beer, right? You'd have like one parent that would be like, this is very severe, we uh, must take away the car and send to military school. And the other parent would be like, I recognize the risks that I'm seeing. However, I think I've developed a mitigation strategy and we should pursue that, right? So uh, if you look at you know, the United States and Europe right now, Europe is, uh, Germany and the UK to a certain extent are very much in the, t in the, in the pool of let's mitigate the risk. We have a mitigation strategy, but we recognize the same thing you recognize. So uh, James, you, when you talk to people around the world about um, what they think of the US kind of hard approach that I guess is beginning to soften, uh, what do you, you hear? Do you think that we're going to have any success in convincing other nations to not just accept the same thing that we're apparently all seeing, but also accept the US approach to dealing with it? Oh, I'd split the world into two parts. There's about 20 countries that care about security. Uh, it doesn't map with NATO. Uh, <laughs> and the rest of the world cares about money. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so Huawei offers you, why is Huawei so successful? Uh, because they can offer you whopping discounts. And so in a recent case in Europe, they offered a 90% discount under what their competitor was asking. Yeah. Hard for a lot of countries to turn that down unless they care for security. And so among those 20 countries, though, the media hasn't got it quite right. There's a complete agreement about the risk of using Huawei. What people differ on is what the best way to mitigate that is. And you're seeing both, you know, some people saying ban, some people saying partial ban, some people saying set standards. And so we're coming towards some sort of common approach where I think you'll see at least 20 countries agree we don't want to depend on Huawei. Now, the problem for the US, of course, is if you, if you call Africa, you're going to be talking on a Huawei network. If you call parts of Southeast Asia, you're going to be on a Huawei network. So problem one is persuading close allies mm. to do the same thing. And that will probably involve standards. If you know, it's a great name. It's called BNETSA. That's the German network agency. They just came out with a guideline, a set of guidelines for secure telecom equipment. Those will be expanded. We'll get, we'll get a significant portion of the world. Uh, certainly the big economies will go with that, except China, of course. Uh, and then the rest of the world, we have to figure out how do we communicate securely with them? Because we're not going to have a choice. They're going to be buying Huawei. Go ahead, Leland. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I could just make a point, if, if you went back 15 years, the key players in terms of RAN, radio access networks, was mm -hmm. probably Lucent, and maybe Nortel Networks, Motorola. Go back 10 years, um, Ericsson, Alcatel, Lucent. Mm -hmm. Then Huawei comes out of nowhere, right? Um, as John had mentioned, it makes it more secure if we have the ability to have our networks or our carriers non-connected mm -hmm. to a dedicated contract for X amount of years with their equipment, mm -hmm. because then it doesn't give us this, you know, dedicated, you know, uh, uh, dependency on this one company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the right path here uh, to have Huawei as a threat. You know, I'm not going to deny the concern, mm -hmm. but if you have the ability to say, hey. Uh, we can go a wild way, we can go with any company. There's even brand new players. I mean, I mm -hmm. can even say that Intel in a way could be a player. If we uh, offer a uh, network in the box, you know, key capability. Yeah. You know, we're not getting into the rent space, but the fact is when you go software defined, you have the ability to have these white, white boxes, it takes away that real strong dependency. Mm -hmm. I think one of the primary concerns that we really need to look at here is frequency. Yeah. You know? Well, I want to get. I want, I want to talk on that in, in just yeah. a second. But let me uh, turn to first uh, John uh, Nagengast. How, when AT and T, and I know you can't speak entirely on their behalf, but when AT and T looks at the future of this market, uh, Huawei being able to offer such enormous discounts, being first to market in so many ways, how much of this market does AT and T feel like it's still kind of up? How do you compete against? Uh, uh, an entity run by the state that can offer those discounts and is already uh, playing ball in places where you haven't set up shop yet. Well, we, you know, number one, for, for our domestic wireless network, we have announced we will not be using Huawei or ZTE equipment. Right. We will be partnering with Samsung, with uh, Nokia, and with Ericsson. Right. It's also interesting to see that the Chinese wireless carriers are also making deals, they're making new deals with Nokia and Ericsson mm -hmm. because they don't want to be locked into a Chinese supplier either, even though it is less expensive. So, right. uh, so it's a mixed bag out there in terms of people hedging their bets. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the concerns we've always had about Huawei and back in the 3G days when we were looking at, okay, who, who could the potential supplier set be? We looked at Huawei and we said, you know, we, we can't see their financials. Yeah. We don't know how long this company is going to be around. They're being propped, obviously, they're being propped up by the Chinese government in a variety of ways. That's why they can offer some of these fabulous discounts that they provide. Right. So what, what, if the, what if all of a sudden the Chinese government changes their mind about that and uh, you know, Huawei goes away as a supplier? We, we went through that with Nortel. We went through that with Motorola. We went through that with Alcatel. We don't want to do that again. So, mm -hmm. so we don't want to be tied to a supplier. And evidently, neither do the Chinese wireless carriers, who are several of the larger, you know, China is the largest wireless market in the world in terms of subscribers. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're not, uh, you know, they're hedging their bets as well about, uh, about their own, you know, national providers in terms of the, uh, the, the hardware software business. 
So I don't know, I don't know what to make of that in a, in co, in a, in a strategic sense. Mm -hmm. But again, all the wireless carriers, right now in the Linux Foundation, which we're sponsoring the uh, ORAN and uh, ONAP software, open source software developments, which will be Network and, and RAN, which we believe will merge together into one software mm -hmm. standard eventually. Uh, right now, the, the RAN functionality is very much like a, a big network. It's just just a little different in terms of what you're managing. Yeah. So and uh, you know, so we're trying to figure out our you know how we weave our way through that, and so are all the other wireless carriers and the uh, providers in the world. Yeah. Uh, the sophisticated ones that have the technical capabilities. They're always the 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 uh, poor, you know, local guy who can who says. I just got to pick, yeah, I'll pick the lowest cost guy and yeah. have him do the whole thing, which is what basically what Huawei does. Yeah. Not only they have been successful in selling their hardware and software, but they come in and operate the network basically for the, uh, all of Africa. If you go in the back rooms of all the wireless providers, right. there's Chinese speakers in there because they're Huawei employees or ZT employees yeah. that are running the infrastructure on behalf of the, uh, the local provider. Yeah. So right now, the, all, the, all the large wireless carriers and the ones that are particularly technically sophisticated are supporting the move to the open source software model and the virtualization model because they want to disaggregate away from being locked into a particular vendor. Mm -hmm. You know, once Huawei got you, they got you. you yeah. know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, it's, and it's hard. That's why uh, there's a lot of resistance in Europe and other places saying, oh, well, I yeah. don't want to see Huawei banned. I'm kind of stuck, right? Yeah. I'm very pregnant now with Huawei, and I, I don't know how to get out of that position. Well, so, and, and, and on this, there's a, a, a very interesting report from the NATO Cyber Center of Excellence that came out very recently, and there's also one from uh, GCHQ's kind of spin-off that, that looks at uh, specifically Chinese telecom, and they both basically say the same thing, which is that um, if you're really smart, you can mitigate the risks in a very short-term way. If you go out a little bit farther, you can't mitigate the risks, but one of the things that we're doing is we're developing these big sort of government centers to go in and uh, GCHQ, to like pull apart uh, the software and this hardware and really take a long look at it. And uh, that if you consider the price of that, then it actually makes all of this stuff more expensive because there's, uh, it's more expensive for a government as well. But it, so I wanted to ask James, because you're giving sort of like a quizzical expression, what do you think is like the mitigation strategy that works? And I would go to you too. Like is, is, is there a government role in mitigation that becomes very large that, or is it a smaller one? You can talk to the GCHQ guys. It's Ian Levy, who uh, used to be GCHQ CTO, mm -hmm. and uh, Kieran Martin, who's the head of this National Cybersecurity Agency. And what they would tell you is when the British BT bought, uh, British Telecom bought Huawei a few years ago, they set up a center, they didn't trust it, they set up a center to review the software that went back and forth. Right. And it doesn't work, right? So you can't mitigate the risk. Uh, that's what they would say. Uh, you can, their theory is that you can um, use partial bands and network architecture to mitigate the risk. So what's a partial ban? It's like, in the, a lot of countries use this, so the French use it too, just sort of off the record. Uh, the, no. The, they, don't <laughs> let, they don't let Huawei into Paris. They don't let Huawei near sensitive uh, military facilities or sensitive intelligence facilities. So if you don't have Huawei in the neighborhood. And the second thing is that people think there's, we've heard a lot about radio access network. That's your phone talking to the cell tower. And then the core network, which is the cell tower. This is very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, the cell tower talking to the core network. Right? And the theory is in Europe that if I let Huawei play in the RAN network, but keep them out of the core network, that's one way to mitigate risk. So they have these architectural solutions. Uh, they have um, these partial bands. Now, remember, a lot of these countries will tell you flat out, we are not going to go public. You know? So I mean, one of the problems, I think, with the reporting on this is they'll say, well, hardly anyone has banned Huawei. And actually, about uh, six countries have banned Huawei. It's just been partial bans, mm -hmm. right? And they don't go around announcing it. One of the smaller, a small Middle Eastern ally, gee, who could that be? Um, came and said, look, we're not the United States. We're not going to pick a fight with China, but we're not going to let Huawei into our networks. So don't always believe what you read in the press. Is that something that the US is considering? Is that a possible possibility? I think the US is having a number of discussions internally about the appropriate approach we want to take. 
uh, as a separate point, um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll say this is um, uh, at a technical level, it's, 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 you know, when, especially as we're moving towards software, and we talk about supply chain. Supply chain is, I, I really don't like the, uh, really don't like the term. We're talking about third party risk, mm -hmm. whether that's from the hardware people adopt or whether it's software or services people allow into their enterprise. Software is, it, I got to tell you, it's, it's extremely tricky. Um, uh, a lot of this is a software assurance issue. You know, I mean, we, we you, people talk about like a backdoor, another term that I hate. Like yeah. there is going to be, uh, you know, a code comment that is like, you know, Chinese MSS, this is, this is where you have access. It's not, what we're looking for, and I can't take credit for this, is Rob Joyce's word, is a bug <laughs> door. We're looking for a vulnerability mm -hmm. that has been introduced or has been left in right. that, a, that, a, that, a, that a spy agency yeah. knows about and can leverage mm -hmm. um, to, to accomplish, you know, to, to get access to, to a particular uh, device or get access uh, to a network. Mm -hmm. um, throw into that patch updates. Mm -hmm. And you add in a time factor. And it, given all the time in the world, it's it's tough enough to find a vulnerability in a piece of software. Mm -hmm. Add a time factor where you have to um, find that vulnerability before the next patch update, in which the code it could be completely taken out mm -hmm. or a new vulnerability entered. What you get in is you get a massive resource requirement to to continually catch vulnerabilities. And there's been software that's been out for years, mm -hmm. a decade, where new vulnerabilities are being discovered. Right. So you know, it, it, mitigating basically. The the, the key question is this, is can you um, ensure security long term for a piece of software that right. has been actively updated? And most security professionals will tell you that you cannot 100% guarantee security just from that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so th then the approach becomes, you know, with a high risk vendor, a vendor that you think long term is uh, you know, you look for areas, you know, broadly in your network where you could potentially defend your network against them, right. limit their access, uh, uh, limit the the scale that they could cause disruption, collect information. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we got to understand this is a high risk vendor that you know at some point in time is going to um, there is going to be pressure on them where they're going to have access, mm -hmm. and uh, it's letting the fox in the hen house. Yeah. It's not a smoking gun, it's a loaded gun. And you have to look at it like that. Yeah. And you have to look at where it's pointed, where it's gonna go, and you know what areas of the hen house you allow the fox access to. But you can't really comment on whether or not the US should or is considering this sort of like physical bifurcation that James was talking about, where you have like a little section that you wheel, like you sort of section off for the radioactivity that is uh, Chinese telecom, and everyone else can proceed along safer lines, like a little, a little detour around the dangerous spot. What are you considering, like more physically? Like uh, I think we're considering a variety of options. Okay. Obviously, can't comment on what okay. direction we're going to go, but uh, I will tell you this, is the US, um, for all that's talk about specific one vendor or another, the U.S. really wants does not. I, mean, I don't think we don't want to continue playing a whack-a-mole approach. Right. We want to make sure that we have a, a proper set of risk criteria by which we identify a high-risk vendor, mm -hmm. and we have a slate of options by which we would mitigate risk, whether you know at a technical level, whether working with private industry, or whether it is you know their presence <coughs> in certain sections of U.S. critical infrastructure. Yeah. I think. Um, we, we don't want to continue playing the tactical game. Right. We want to play a long game where we have a more um, productive conversation and way to have these conversations about uh, high risk vendors in our supply chain. Okay, so, uh, so on, on, on this question of uh, sectioning things out for different parties and the way that relates to 5G, the, the question of spectrum came up earlier, and this is an area where US policy actually can make sort of a difference. There's a very good article uh, out in PC Mag yesterday uh, that, that basically talks about the relationship between spectrum and 5G, and it points out that uh, part of the reason 5G is, is, is more efficient is not because of magic, uh, it's, it's because it uh, larger channel sizes. And uh, the author writes that uh, for 5G, in order for it to be truly transformative, it needs like broad slices of like 100 megahertz. And if you think about US uh, just spectrum, think of it as like a parking lot, right? And right now, right in the middle, 
uh, a bunch of satellite companies in the Navy have an RV that's like parked bad, right? <laughs> so like it's sort of stuck like right here. And there's a question about how much, uh, well, uh, if we really want to dominate in this space, if we really want uh, to excel here, uh, how much of that can be opened up or moved around to allow for uh, carriers to do a little bit more. So I'd love everyone's thoughts on, on the importance of spectrum and, and particularly that sort of big range right in the middle and how to whether or not it serves a national security need to divvy it up uh, and how that conversation should go. Go ahead, Leland. I was going to make a point. One of the key aspects to the differences between 4G and 5G is technology scopes, right? So what we call 5G, the technologies frame there is massive MIMO. Uh, ultra low latency um, throughput uh, beam forming mm -hmm. one is one of the key things. Uh, uh, full duplexing of the signals, mm -hmm. uh, transmit and receive at the same time, and and also the frequency uh, portfolio that 5G can work on. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a millimeter waves; it's also sub six uh, gigahertz spectrums. So when you look at it from that set standpoint. Uh, most of the frequencies, as far as I know, are owned by carriers in areas, right? And then also government agencies or military agencies. Right. So spectrum sharing has to be a key component here uh, in terms of, not, not in terms of the commercial aspect, but also with the government aspect too. Mm -hmm. uh, utilizing spectrum, spectrum utilization. Um, Intel actually has a group that really focuses in on spectrum sharing aspects in terms of the uh, technology. Let's face it, when we make a modem, the modem has to be able to communicate on multiple frequency paths. So mm -hmm. that's where that software-defined frequency selection is a key component of the uh, technology, uh, not just from the carrier or RAN developer, but also from the, from the client or phone or car or whatever side of the track. Yeah. So I think that's a key a aspect here. Um, in terms of threats for that, well, you know, let's face it, if you can find a way to jam frequencies or you cause some type of confusion in terms of changing the software and having it instead of your phone connecting to AT&T, you may mm -hmm. want to connect to three other carriers and cause some kind of communications chaos. That could be a, 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 a concern. But it really, what we're, what we're really focusing in on with an Intel is how can we really contribute to that spectrum sharing aspect and how can we really help the uh, technology move forward in terms of developing capabilities to not only have the devices change frequencies but understand where those threats exist hmm. and transfer you know uh, you know connectivity over to another frequency sub within the band that's really because that's like kind of what the f-35 does when people are trying to mess with it is uh, sort of ai applied to spectrum hopping and like signals detection right? ai and, and also from to, from that standpoint we're looking at technology that that will infuse or interconnect or cross connect yeah ai compute wireless technologies and also mobile edge compute capabilities as well so all of those aspects are key um, and just just one more one more point, uh, kind of a you know related point. The more the more convenient, the less secure. Yeah. So the more connections we have, the less secure we are. It's just a reality. Mm -hmm. You know, most of my personal stuff is on a disconnected hard drive in the corner of, of my house for a reason. Yeah. Um, not that we can't solve it, but yeah, it is a threat. The more we connect things, the more there's more frequency connect connectivity going on, the more we have an issue that we need to really look at. Okay, John, at and is they've got a lot of stuff moving out in like the 10 to 14 sort of megahertz? Yeah, well, we're, we're you know, there, there's the, a couple of different schools of thought, okay? Yeah. And our, our school of thought is we'll take whatever is available and use it as effectively as we can. Obviously, millimeter waves are going to be very important mm -hmm. in the dense urban areas. Right. Uh, you know, and so we're, we're, that's what we have in operation today in, uh, in our 12 city deployment that went operational on the 21st of December. Mm -hmm. We're using millimeter waves in the 30 gigahertz band right now. Uh, we just heard on Friday that the uh, chairman of the FCC announced another millimeter wave spectrum auction, <coughs> excuse me, coming in December, and we were yeah. very excited to see that. There's also a lot of debate about what to do in the sub six spans mm -hmm. and how to share them. Uh, can DOD give up some of their capacity? Can it be shared? And we'd like to see some sharing arrangement put in place. 
but it has to be practical to manage that as well because you know you can't you can't share if you can't manage the sharing right if you start interfering with each other that's not a good situation to be in as well right so while we're very interested in the possibility of sharing yeah. we're also concerned about how would we manage that we we're here there operating happily along and our customers are humming along and all of a sudden dod decides they're going to launch an exercise in the desert and man they shut they, you know everything gets jammed by because they're now sharing the band well yeah. that's that's not a good situation to be in yeah so but it's not an either or it, it is a uh, you know kind of the laws of physics are still the same yeah we, we need this bandwidth we want to cut down on the latency to support the self-driving car and the smart city uh, so how do we do that within the physics of, of the real world mm -hmm. and that's going to require a very broad uh, you know spectrum capability but much more than we've ever done mm -hmm. uh, but that's where we're going right now yeah. and, and it's all the above in terms of we're not favoring you know, sub six versus millimeter, it's all the above. Uh, so, uh, John Costello, is DHS looking at spectrum sharing as something that uh, you should advise in a policy way in order to deal with this, or is that not even something that you're looking? I, I think we're, um, prim I mean, obviously there's, uh, I mean, you know, 5G, 5G is, uh, you know, talking about as a cybersecurity issue, but like, I think uh, first and foremost, it is, it is a, sort of a, con it's a communications issue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we're largely, the uh, vast majority of our focus is on uh, the network. Right, right. Um, I think the spectrum, we would defer to our, uh, our sister agencies and departments in the federal government. Okay. And uh, um, obviously the White House and the president. And, yeah, and, but, and, and but one thing we want to do is we want to be a little more precise in how we talk about 5G. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a lot about supply chain security, and that's where Huawei plays in, right? And we'll deal with that by not taking any of that in. What you're talking about now with Spectrum is deployment, and that's yeah. largely in that. We aren't in a race with Huawei to deploy, right? We're in a race with ourselves. We're not winning. Uh, but mm -hmm. the question is which country can be faster at freeing up Spectrum Mm -hmm. to enable 5G deployment. Mm -hmm. The Chinese strategy is they're going to do Beijing and Shanghai first because that's where the companies are that will come up with the new apps. Mm -hmm. If you think about your smartphone, we saw 4G come along, you got a smartphone. A whole economy grew up around the, the app economy. It's currently about 6% of GDP, so it's real money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 5G will enable apps across a whole range of devices. Who's going to write those apps? Who writes those apps will be the people who have access to 5G first. And that's what the race is. Will the Chinese free up spectrum? Uh, they have an advantage because Xi Jinping can just say, uh, and it happens, right? <laughs> uh, or will we get there? Right now, it's a little neck and neck. We have some problems. Uh, our regulatory structure could be described as inefficient because you have local, state, federal regulations. Yep. If you make one happy, you still have to deal with the other two, right? So don't think of this as a Huawei race or as a race even. It's like who's going to deploy in a way that will let their innovators in their, their startup companies come up with the new apps that will create value for you know, the digital economy, the mm -hmm. 5G economy. And that just won't be telecom. It'll be your car, as we've heard. Mm -hmm. It'll be healthcare. Uh, it'll be finance. Mm -hmm. um, God only knows. We don't know what it'll be. But that's what we're talking about is who frees up the spectrum first so that their companies can then start writing new apps for a uh, 5G environment. And what I hear is that you know the US is doing OK. Uh, the announcement from the White House last week helps. Uh, but the Chinese do have an advantage, because if you're a local community, and you say, well, I, you know, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want those cell phone towers in my neighborhood. The Chinese, the what do they call it? The um, uh, the um, MPS comes and just squashes you, splat. Right? <laughs> that doesn't happen here. Right? So they may have an advantage, but right now it's kind of neck and neck. Who will deploy first, giving their innovators the chance to write those new 5G apps? Okay, uh, I want to open it up for questions because uh, D Director Evenman is here also for questions along with our panel. Uh, so if you have them, and I'm sure you do, let's uh, see some hands. We've got one right back here. Yes. I can talk loud, but so Mike Fritzi, Potomac Institute. Um, I, I don't know if people are aware, I just finished reading a really good report by the Defense Innovation Board on 5G, and, mm -hmm. and they mentioned the distinction between the sub six and the and the millimeter wave, right? So I'd like to probe the panel a little bit further on 
Is it practical? Because they make the point that if we lose the race to sub six, which we might because of all the spectrum that's being used already, that's mm -hmm. not free, then we're not the first mover anymore. So is there really, are there really practical ways to share or reallocate spectrum on the race scale that, that Jim just mentioned? Right? I mean, because it sounds to me like sub six is the first part of the race. You have, well, you have well I, I, would, I differ a little bit with what the Defense Innovation Board wrote because they, they kind of portrayed it as a either or. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. sub, sub millimeter or, or sub six, and who's going to, what are we going to choose the winning side, which they seem to argue with sub six. And there's one sentence in the report, I think it's on page 36, I happen to read it over the weekend, <laughs> it said, but you, oh, might have to, <laughs> but you might have to do both. <laughs> and that's exactly what the real world is doing. The real world is doing both. And we're doing, you know, in the cities, I had a friend of mine call me up and he says, well, John, I know that, that at and is deploying these small cells in the urban areas. That's what we turned on in December, as I said. And it's all millimeter. You have to put a, an antenna every 300 feet, which is where these local zoning th things come in. You know, we, we want to put a, an antenna on each telephone pole in the right of way without having to go through six months of zoning, you know, with the local uh, you know, planning authority. And even Maryland was trying to pass a law to that effect in this last legislative session, and they decided to appoint a study commission for the summer, so it's going to be till next January before they even get to serious, seriously taking up that issue. Mm -hmm. But the point is that it's, it's got to be both. And uh, yeah, there are things that we can, if we can remove some of the bureaucratic, uh, and, you know, we are, we're going to be more, much more competitive in the race. But you know, I think the, a lot of the assessment that they did was, was very valuable. But it's not a either or, or we're, well, we're competing on this band or that band. We need all the spectrum we can get. And uh, when you get out of the urban areas where you can have a telephone pole every 300 feet, you're going to be using six uh, sub six. You're going to be using the established channels. And we will be phasing out 3G services and reusing those frequencies at 750 meg in, in the 5G realm as quickly as we can. That's what we did when we phased out 2G. We moved it into 4G. So it's going to be a rolling game, and we're, we're very in involved in trying to figure out how to make that happen as quickly as possible. And turning off somebody's 3G phone uh, is, you know, well, we don't like to do that. But on the other hand, you know, sooner or later, you got to say, guys, it's time to move on to the next, the next technology. So we give them a free phone and make, you know, hopefully make them happy, and, and then we go on from there. Also, the one, the, I just want to say real quick, definitely, government and industry have to work together because it oh, isn't yeah, just absolutely. industry because there is spectrum allocation that has. Well, to Well, there's a whole bunch of things that we have to work together on, and if, again, read the please read the INSA report when it comes out, and one one of things that also I wanted to mention because Jim got into a little bit about the uh, the application space if you ask me uh, where where are the vulnerabilities going to be it's not going to be in the core we know how to we pretty know how to harden a wireless infrastructure today there were, there are going to be surprises of course because it's there's some degree it introduces several degrees of complexity that we haven't dealt with before but on the other hand, we know how to deal with those, and we're making the infrastructure we're deploying as secure as we know how to make it. When you get into the application space, when you start talking about smart cities, smart healthcare, that's where we're going to define the surprises and the security vulnerabilities. Gee, I didn't know if I wrote the code that way, that would let the, let the Chinese come in and turn off the city at 5, uh, at 5 p.m. every night, you know? So that's where we're going we're gonna to learn as we move into that applications arena. Different spectrum bands are more useful for different applications. And I usually think of them as three, high, medium, and low, right? And so for what you do in a hospital or a factory, you need one spectrum band. For what you do for telecom, you might need another. For what you do for smart cities, you might yeah. need a third. So it's, if I was going to disagree a little bit with the report, it's that you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all spectrum game here. And you want to think, how do I get the benefits for healthcare, or how do I get the benefits for manufacturing? It may not depend on the, the this spectrum ranges you're talking about. Well, and also one more point, within the 3G PP per protocol, and, and, and this also goes back to uh, 4G, the space of 4G and 5G are really related. It's just a difference in the, uh, in the, uh, numer the numerology, excuse me, uh, within the channels. Is uh, There's a couple of uh, technologies that can utilize lower bands and higher bands. Um, I think one is called network duality, 
you can have a lot of your control channels and broadcast channels on low, lower bands that could umbrella a lot of your traffic nodes that will be under that. Hence, you know, a better use of your frequency. And then you go to link assisted access, which gives you unlicensed band access. So, you know, just, just from a standpoint of how you could deploy the, uh, the uh, technologies, both sub six and, and, and the millimeter wave makes sense to do at the same time. Other questions? Somebody? I, I'll, I, I, okay, right over here. So you really scared me when you talked about open source software running inside the cellular network that I'm going to be relying on mm -hmm. for my automated car and smart cities. Yeah. Uh, how, how much effort is, is going into understanding how that software works, the vulnerabilities in it. Um, as you said, there's going to be, you're multiplying the, the, um, the numbers of, of, of pieces of software that you're integrating together, which in significantly increases the connectivity and the vulnerability, to interactive vulnerabilities. Um, as you get to more and more complex systems like that, it, it takes a lot more effort to understand all the different interactions that can occur and the security implications of that. So can you talk to a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, there's no perfect answer to the software assurance question. You know, I, I, I spent several years of my life trying to develop a trusted operating system, working with some of the leaders in the industry about how, to, how can we build a, a kernel that will make sure that nothing bad happens on this, on this desktop or laptop, right? I mean, that was, that was the holy grail 20 years ago. We never could get there, okay? So, but, but in, in that sense, you know, all software, you're going to find issues, you know, one, one, as I used to say, you know, one person's feature is another person's vulnerability, right? <laughs> so I, if you're going to be an attacker, you want to look at all these special features that they build into the software to accommodate a remote printer or something like that. It's, aha, here's a perfect way to get right in there uh, through the, re the remote port for the printer. So, uh, but, you know, if you, if you look at the balance on that, okay, would you rather have five vendors with proprietary software to choose from for your radio access network, or would you rather have one that's been you know, developed in a, in a consortia approach, repeatedly tested, looked at by a variety of uh, people, either there are people that are involved in the development of the open source software, and we're working, again, we're working through the Linux Foundation to do that, and uh, all 70% all of the major wireless carriers in the globe are involved in that, in that effort. Uh, so that's about, and it's getting as much scrutiny as it can from outside researchers, and they, they make a lot of contributions into, to the, into the open, even though they're not a developer per se. So it, it, it's probably the best balance you can find between taking uh, proprietary software from company X or company Y and hoping that they did a good job of, of testing it out versus uh, you know, going open source. Again, there's no perfect answer, but I think on balance, we're, we're more, much more comfortable, I believe, with the open source approach at the end of the day. Now again, are there gonna be surprises? There are gonna be things in there that we didn't know were there? Uh, very possible, but you know, on, there's no perfect way to do software and have it, you know, uh, we used to talk about orange book class, uh, class five formal method proofs. Those don't work. Yeah. So, so what are you going to do? The best thing we can do is make it as transparent. We believe that making the software development process, uh, making it as transparent as possible and having as many eyes looking at it as possible is the, is the best approach on balance. Again, and the other thing, other benefits come along with that. Like I'm not locked in for life with this vendor that sold me this software because nothing else will work with that on my, on my radio access network. All right, I'm gonna exert uh, moderator privilege very quickly and ask Director Evan Nina because he's here and it's great to have you here available for questions. Uh, in terms of mitigating this threat, what are the three most important things you are doing now and or are about to do in the next uh, couple of years? 
Well, I think mitigation is probably the wrong word to ask me. I think that's probably more in line with not only private sector industry, the current carriers, DHS, FBI, and, and I, I would say national policy. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to stay, you know, keep my space in the threat space mm -hmm. where we could uh, continue to advise and inform what the threat spectrum is, what's the landscape for this vulnerability. You heard some great uh, examples of what this could look like in the future cities. And mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, the experts talking about the exploits and the software and the capabilities, it's scary to think about at that speed at which they move to have open source software um, driving our car and, mm -hmm. and handling our healthcare system. So I'll stay out of that mitigation uh, sector. I just do think as uh, we have to continue to drive this public-private partnership with an American mindset here. Yeah. What, is, what is the role for us as an American society and how does that look and feel for us, uh, not only 10 years from now, but 25 years from now? So there's a lot of outreach, is, is a big part of what you're doing. Yeah, right? I think there's outreach, outreach, but I also think there's a lack of understanding. And okay. I think you look at the, the panel of experts here, they clearly understand this. But I will proffer the rest of America doesn't understand not only what 5G means, what this, uh, they, the consumers love the idea of it, uh, they love the mindset of it, but I think when you, anything, even in current business now, when you add the third or fourth or fifth pillar of security, it mm -hmm. can scare the people who own the space. Yeah. So I think we have to find the right balance between understanding the threat and vulnerability, potential consequences, as John talked about, what happens if there's catastrophic failure, the mm -hmm. failures or not. Uh, the implications are much uh, more grand than they are now when you're in a 5G capacity. Balance of that with respect to without being the boogeyman and mm -hmm. how do we get to a, a clean space where we could uh, be productive and have the modern society we want to have mm -hmm. uh, without having the vulnerabilities that make us subservient to uh, bad actors. Do you take this message to counterparts in Europe? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, we referenced that and I think it came out public today. If not, I'm going to get in trouble. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's going to be a meeting in Prague in May of uh, 30 countries to talk about this. Uh, yeah. It's five eyes plus NATO folks plus others uh, to talk about what this looks like on a global scale. And I think they're going to address some of the same things we talked about here, more from a policy perspective uh, and what does it look like globally. And I think that's the right thing to do. This isn't a USA problem. This mm -hmm. is the global infrastructure problem. It's a global software problem. It's a global operability problem. So mm -hmm. I think multiple countries, uh, and I think Jim talked about you know the six countries or eight countries who care about security. I think this will take those eight countries and try and expand that beyond and get mm -hmm. those money makers to want to understand you can still make money a little bit less, but have some secure networks. At the end of the day, the government's accountability responsibility is protect its people, its data, its structures. And I think this 5G will allow us to understand that more fundamentally. Um, it, it, it did come out yesterday. It's a very good report by Reuters, um, uh, which I recommend to all of you. Can you, and then we'll turn back to the audience again for more questions, but how would you characterize the evolution and response that you've gotten from your European counterparts? Does it seem like they're catching up? Does it seem like you're making? Progress? I can only speak for uh, my counterparts, which, you, which are in the intelligence services. They clearly get yeah. the threat. They understand the vulnerabilities, um, and they work in the space I work in, which is just metaphorically one slice of pizza. And, and there are other slices of pizza that have implications uh, yeah. from global trade and economics, and some of our European countries are already bedrocked with Huawei equipment, right? Okay. So, so it's a little Absolutely. bit easier for us to have a, this conversation than it is other countries who are, uh, have been beholden for 20 years in Huawei capability, and now they're faced with what Jim talked about and what and, uh, GCHQ talked about, the vulnerabilities, and maybe, this, maybe their products aren't that good now, right? Yeah. So, and, so I think we're in a different space than our European counterparts, so I think it's an opportunity to take what our intel services know provide it to our policymakers and find some common ground. Okay, other questions? I just I want to make a, a real yeah. quick point real fast. Um, I think one of the key problems that we have with any wireless link, and most of them are non-intelligent links, I don't want to use dumb. Um, I think AI, mm -hmm. well, in fact, you know, a lot of the things that we're looking at within Intel is how to have AI as a part of the link itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, not just from the standpoint of the traffic, but even from the uh, control channels that will mm -hmm. be involved. And really infusing AI, coupling it really. Because if you think about it, we could talk 5G until we're red in the face, 6, 6G will come soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have more technology scopes and less hardware, you go to 7G. So it's really an issue of as more things are connected, because let's realize the driving factor now is not the human being, it's just a machine. Mm -hmm. you know, there's more connected devices. So you have to have a level of an intelligent link that understands what's being transmitted, how, how, to, how to really secure it. I think that's the next layer that needs to come into play later. Say AI. Yeah, yeah no, it's, a, it's an interesting. Other questions? There's got to be. 
Nobody? Oh, here we go. Back, in, back here in the back. I'm curious if you can give us a little bit of a background into who are the players in the United States and amongst our allies that are competing with Huawei. And it sounds like Huawei is already really ahead of the game. They're offering a cheaper solution. What, what's the differentiator that the United States is offering uh, so that our allies can actually sign up? With well, else. the United States does not have a what I would call a serious competitor competitor in the wireless business, akin to a, a, a wireless solution provider like Huawei. They sell you the package. The closest we come today is Cisco, who is partnered in ran software development with Ericsson, and uh, and they're doing some things in that realm. Uh, and again, you know, there's other players like Intel that are in the, in the game as well with their software virtualization network packages and things like that. But there is no U.S. supplier today that I can turn to and say, okay, Motorola in the good old days, go, yeah. you know, build me my wireless infrastructure and make it secure. That doesn't exist. Motorola Mobility has now been bought by Len Lenovo, for example. So, yeah. it's, 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 so there's five companies that make this stuff. Nokia and Ericsson in Europe, Huawei and ZTE in China, and Samsung. Samsung has about a 5% market share, but they want to grow that. Uh, Ericsson has the biggest share, Huawei second, ZTE is at the bottom. So there are partners or allies who make this stuff. One thing that gets that left out a lot is that Huawei could not make 5G equipment, Huawei could not make telephone equipment without US components. And so Intel, Qualcomm, Xilinx, if you know who they are, uh, Cisco. Um, if you take a Huawei box apart, it's all US components. And you, the flip side is not true. China depends on the US technology. The US does not depend on Chinese technology. It's cheaper, right? So we'll put it in. But if you had to go, it's sort of lower level stuff. You could, you could replace it. So Huawei's deal though is they have a subsidized price and they're really good at c customer service right so they'll go when you go to when you go to shenzhen they have a building that has a mock-up of every customer's network and so they're on top of it they monitor it gee that makes you wonder doesn't it um <laughs> but they have great customer service they have great prices their equipment's pretty good but they're not the only people in this and one of the things you hear from the carriers this is john's cue um, is they want supply chain diversity. They don't want to be locked into a single company. Huawei would like to be a monopoly, and that's one of their goals, right? And so when we all depend on Huawei, that would be bad. Uh, it would be good for uh, MSS. Uh, it might not be good for us. But you have these other suppliers. And we have a window, probably, depending on what you look at, three to five years, maybe five to 10 years, where the Chinese will not be able to make the kind of chips that uh, you need to have 5G. Yeah, they're paddling hard to be in that business, yeah. but they're not there yet. Yeah, that's the one one piece of hardware we have leverage over them is with their with our devices, Intel, Qualcomm, and other companies. And you saw the ZTE near death experience when they were banned, and that was a shock to the Chinese. They now have a, I think it's 128 billion devoted over five years to build their own chip industry. Man, we could not come up with 128 billion. But um, they just don't know how to do it yet. You know, if you're willing to spend $128 billion for a long time, um, eventually you'll get there. But right now, uh, we're the ones holding the leash, not them. Yeah, and it's interesting because we have a lot of offshore. U.S. companies typically do offshore fabrication and packaging, but the Chinese, and a lot of that's in China, but they can't do the in innovation mm -hmm. in the chipset, in the chip devices, like an Intel or a Qualcomm that puts you in the 5G business in a dynamic kind of way. Yeah, no Intel, no Qualcomm, no 5G. Yeah, okay. like, like SS. Wait, we have guess one more from. That's a clue. Directly yeah, for you. <laughs> Today. Actually, I have a question. It's nice to be on this side of the room here. Um, I guess it's a question for both Jim and John, based upon your last joint comment. So, if a Huawei box is predominantly US made technology and equipment. Components, some components, the key components. Right. Memory right. devices right. come from all over, you know, but, but the real process, the, the smart processors, the Snapdragons components. are US. Gotcha. US. So use that as a premise. So what is it gonna take 
for U.S. industry to say, wait a minute, we're making this already. Why aren't we going to make the box? Why aren't we going to be competitive in this space? From an from a industry perspective, what is it going to take for the U.S. to be a competitor or a U.S. company to be a competitor if we believe that to be true with the Huawei's, the ZTE's, the Samsung? Uh, what, what we found is that, to, and I've seen this with IBM and with a lot of other companies, they're not going to compete in the commodity space. Okay, you know, we saw IBM sold their PC business and laptop business to Lenovo, and everybody was shocked. My God, how could they do that? Well, they said, you know, I, and I knew some of the IBM senior exec leadership when I was back at the agency, talked to them all the time. And they said, you know, we're, we're competing for pennies on the dollar. You know, anybody can build a laptop. Yeah, you know, not, that's not quite true, but you know, but you know, they said it's a commodity marketplace. We don't want. We want to play in the innovation space. We want to do the the uh, super duper computers and the the trusted brains and all the smart artificial intelligence. That's where we want to be. Not cranking out. You know, how how cheap can we make a laptop in Ireland? You know, that's so. So that's, that's been part of the history of the U.S., why this manufacturing thing has kind of migrated away from us, because the U.S. vendors have said, you know, that's, that's commoditized. I want to play in the innovation space, which is a good thing, but we haven't really figured out how to put all those pieces together, okay? We looked uh, in both the Bush administration and the Obama administration about building an American competitor. And it would cost you, depending on who you talk to, between seven billion and 20 billion. And Uncle Sam was just not willing to pony up, right? Now, that's okay because you could, you could think uh, you could subsidize Nokia or Ericsson. Uh, I don't think you need to subsidize Samsung, but we can maintain supplier diversity without a US company. Uh, the other part is the, the white box theory you've been hearing about. Those white boxes are gonna depend on Intel uh, Intel and Qualcomm, and also uh, field programmable field programmable gate arrays, FPGA. FPGA. Hate yeah. saying it, sorry. <laughs> right now, only the U.S. can make them. So you, when you move to the white box world, people are saying, "Well, let's just wait. You're going to be depending on American stuff, anyhow." Um, I hope that's true. I think it's lar there's a good chance it's true, but that's part of it. Is it's a lot of money now, and people have this hope that will, you know, in the Previous administration, when this came up, um, we looked at using Defense Production Act money, and mm. it, there just isn't enough funding to build a competitor. And so the, their theory was, well, don't worry about it. Google will save us. Uh, <laughs> Google, Google did not save us, but that's the hope, is that we'll be able to out-innovate. There's a great quote by Carl Sagan from 1996 that goes, I have a foreboding of an American, my children and grandchildren's time in the United States as a service and information economy. We nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries when awesome technological powers are in the hands of very few and no one uh, representing the rest of us has a say. So there we are. Anyway, uh, time's up. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank